American President Obama and Canadian Prime Minister Harper have unveiled a new border security agreement that has received scant attention in the American media. However, far from being a new arrangement, what this accord represents is only the latest in a chain of usurpations of national sovereignty. This is your GRTV Backgrounder for GlobalResearch.tv. When Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper and U.S. President Barack Obama announced the much-anticipated border agreement between the two countries at a press conference in Washington last week, those mainstream media outlets that bothered to cover the story at all compensated for the lack of details about what specifically is going to be accomplished by this accord by focusing on issues of no practical significance. The Globe and Mail, for example, ran an entire article about how Harper and Obama's personal friendship allegedly affected the deal, which was admittedly struck by bureaucrats in months of closed-door negotiations. A variety of trade magazines and corporate websites released vague laudatory statements about the streamlining of the border. But the story itself, which generated few headlines at all in the American media, was not about what specifically will change at the border, so much as how the border is increasingly being redefined as just one part of a broader security perimeter that in fact encompasses both the US and Canada. The agreement in fact comprises two so-called action plans, one entitled Beyond the Border and the other the Regulatory Cooperation Council. The former plan focuses on border security with the explicit aim of creating a security perimeter that encompasses both countries. The latter is meant to harmonize regulations for business, facilitating cross-border trade. The security agreement uses the threat of terrorism, crime, and potential health hazards to announce an increasing merger of the two countries' border security including an integrated entry-exit system that will involve full sharing of individuals' biometric details between the two governments by 2014, and even the creation of integrated cross-border law enforcement teams with authority to collect intelligence and conduct criminal investigations on either side of the border. The regulatory plan, meanwhile, aims to standardize agricultural regulations on such items as maximum pesticide residue limits, as well as develop standards and regulations for potential future products and industries like nanotechnology. Although the plans detail certain steps that can be or are being taken, the majority of the information is about agreed-upon shared values and the possibility of cooperation. In light of the relative paucity of details about these action plans, media outlets choose to illustrate the general points of the agreement with seemingly random examples, such as this one about breakfast cereals. Now, the deal is expected to include some controversial elements, including an integrated entry and exit system, keeping tabs on who goes in and out of our countries, a system to address security threats earlier through better information sharing, and unified standards. Right now, Cheerios, believe it or not, are different in Canada and the United States. This would make them exactly the same. Keen-eyed observers of this trivial example might have noted a striking similarity to the way that Prime Minister Harper tried to deflect criticism of the Security and Pro Prosperity Partnership Agreement that sought to merge the governments, security forces, and regulatory framework of the US, Mexico, and Canada back in 2007. So what do the leaders talk about? Well, Prime Minister Stephen Harper offered one example, jelly beans. The rules for jelly bean contents are different in Canada and the United States. They have to maintain two separate inventories. Is the sovereignty of Canada going to fall apart if we standardize the jelly bean? On one level, reducing these agreements to regulations on cereals and jelly beans marginalizes the legitimate criticism and fears about the erosion of national sovereignty implicit in these talks. It also serves to keep the public disinterested in the issues by painting them as dry and unimportant talks about bureaucratic affairs. What this similarity in rhetoric unwittingly reveals, however, is how this latest agreement is in fact nothing new and can only be properly understood as the latest point in a continuing process of merging the bureaucratic, regulatory, and military functions of Canada and the U.S. that has in fact been taking place for a decade. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the two countries began work on reshaping the nature of the world's longest undefended border. This resulted in the Canada-US Smart Border Declaration, an agreement signed in December 2001 that contained much of the same rhetoric as the recent agreement, including vows to coordinate security and law enforcement efforts in the name of facilitating the flow of people and goods between Canada and the States. This led into the Security and Prosperity Partnership, 
a trilateral framework between the governments of the US, Canada, and Mexico that began a process of regulatory integration. Formally launched in 2005, the SPP quickly caught the attention of the public on both sides of the border, and as freedom of information requests shed more light on the process, including the almost total domination of the partnership in closed-door meetings by big business, the SPP's annual summit quickly became a flashpoint for political activism. In the light of public scrutiny, the SPP was shelved in 2009, but many of its initiatives and recommendations continue on behind the scenes. SPP documents, for example, show how Canada's controversial no-fly list was in fact part of a trilateral agreement, with the SPP's 2006 report to leaders in fact mandating the program's June 2007 launch date. Meanwhile, the military merger of Canada and the U.S. has proceeded in its own series of mutual agreements, beginning with the creation of NORTHCOM, the United States Northern Command, in 2002, which charged the U.S. military with the protection of the United States, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Mexico, and Canada. In February of 2008, the Canadian and American military signed an agreement allowing troops of either country to cross the border and carry out operations in the other country in the event of an emergency, such as civil unrest. In 2010, the two countries signed the Shiprider Agreement, allowing the operation of specially designated vessels to patrol the shared waterways of the two countries by joint crew, consisting of both Canadian and American law enforcement. This agreement is cited in the new border proposal as an example of how cross-border policing can be implemented. Now, with increasing cooperation between cross-border law enforcement, Canadians will be expected to allow American officials to pursue their investigations of suspected criminals on Canadian soil. And the process of harmonization means that Canada may even be expected to allow the use of drone surveillance, a technology presently being used by the U.S. to patrol the Canadian border and even to pursue criminal investigations of American citizens far away from that border. Although there are many individual aspects of this latest accord that are worrying, from the militarization of the border to the harmonization of regulatory frameworks to allow for the lowest common denominator in food standards in other areas, to the increasing sharing of information about citizens between the two countries, perhaps the most worrying aspect is the project itself. As many have warned, these seemingly bland border proposals, a story so dull that it has barely been covered at all by the American press, may in fact be used to slip in a North American Union through the gradual merging of the two countries' bureaucratic systems. The most insidious part of this process is that it is not subject to legislative oversight of any kind and is taking place in behind-the-scenes discussions between high-level bureaucrats outside of the glare of public scrutiny, a point that is readily conceded by the proposal's proponents. Mr. Manley, do you worry the American political calendar will derail this? No, actually I don't, um, mainly because other than the appropriation issue, which we've been talking about, uh, there's not really, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's anything, any of the actions that need to be approved by Congress. The, the funding does, but I think everything else is pretty much administrative it, it's, responsibility. It's, it is executive action, it doesn't require legislation, or at least it's, insofar as we can tell at this point, doesn't seem to require legislation. Okay, here's uh, John Ives. Last week I had the chance to talk to Paul Hellyer, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, about this agreement and whether the border security threat that the U.S. is using to justify the process is in fact a ploy to obscure an underlying agenda, the drive to merge Canada and U.S. in a de facto union. I think there is some reason to believe that might be part of it. Um, I have... Um, seen and heard about a young lady, for example, who worked in um, external affairs at the time the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement was signed, who said she actually saw documents that said this is just the first step toward the union of uh, Canada and the United States, and that uh, she was ordered to destroy that document. And now, of course, she's laughed at because uh, that's the way you, uh, you deal with people that tell the truth. So... I'm, I'm not the least bit convinced that it might not be just one more step. The, one of the negotiators of the free trade agreement uh, actually said that, uh, that Canada didn't know what it had signed, that in 20 years it would be sucked into the American economy. Well, I think we were just sucked in, period. And uh, 
everything is moving in that direction. Everything is being uh, coordinated and the, the standards are being adopted, but it's American standards that are being adopted and uh, practices are being changed to, to, to correlate with American practices. And they're, they're proposing some things down there at the moment that are really pretty scary and which are just the absolute opposite of the habeas corpus and, and the Bill of Rights and, uh, and freedom of speech and, uh, and association that, uh, you know, people fought and died for in two world wars. And so I, I really am uh, apprehensive and concerned to, deep down that uh, we're headed in a direction that we really don't want to go in and that uh, somewhere along the line we're going to have to say uh, enough is enough and uh, there's too high a price to pay for uh, for a few bucks and we want uh, to have a little more control over our lives and not have our citizens subject to so much scrutiny by people who well, really have a reputation for being very careless in the way they interpret uh, the information they get from uh, intelligence agencies around the world. Regardless of whether this particular agreement bears fruit for those seeking to bring the two countries into a closer union, or whether it is just another waypoint on the road of a much longer and more detailed process, the very real concerns about the erosion of national sovereignty implicit in this deal is one that those in power are eager to see avoided. So far they are being aided in that quest by a media that chooses to avoid the hard questions about this series of agreements to the extent that they cover them at all. As always, the power belongs in the hands of the people. Without significant pushback from the public, the momentum of these border agreements might be enough to make the North American Union an inevitability. Alternatively, the public can fight back by making this into a key political issue and informing others of the potential threat to the survival of both the US and Canada as sovereign nations. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com.